Hi, I'm Karen Corneal, Deputy Editor at CELL, and we're here at the 79th Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory Symposium on Quantitative Biology, and this year's topic is cognition. I'm pleased to be speaking here with Anne Grabiel of MIT. Thanks for, for being here. Uh, so, you have many different directions of research. One that you talked about yesterday was about um, values, uh, value judgments and decision making in terms of potential trade-offs of rewards and poor outcomes. Can you tell us a little bit about the, the motivation of the research and your recent findings? Yeah, so in neuropsychiatric disorders, the combination of thinking about something good and bad and having to do something that that will be both good and bad or a good and bad outcome in some way. That's called approach avoidance conflict. That actually is a conflict kind of situation that is um, partly diagnostic of some problems related to anxiety and depression. And some years ago, Kenichi Amamori came to the lab and worked out a way to use this kind of a conflict situation task in non-human primates, in, in macaque monkeys, in fact. And the idea was that we were trying to figure out what corticostriatal pathways do, and the guess was maybe they have something to do with weighing different levels of goodness and badness mm -hmm. in a given situation. Um, and, and that was because we were interested in this compartmental, compartmental ordering in the striatum. And it, it is a funny thing that you have this huge ball of cells, but weaving through it, um, like holes in driftwood or so, are, are these specialized zones that we thought, based on anatomy, a lot of people thought, were related to uh, something about reinforcement or emotion, something like that. So that's a long-winded way of saying that in the search of what those regions might do, mm -hmm. we targeted regions of the cortex that we knew to project to them. And the amazing thing is those regions, it takes a while, those regions have been over and over implicated in conditions related to mood disorders mm -hmm. in general, OCD, um, addiction, anxiety disorders. Mm -hmm. So. We set out to do that and, and actually showed that we can change the macaque's decision making in such a task by manipulating um, particular regions of the medial prefrontal cortex and caudal orbital frontal cortex, two hot spots mm -hmm. uh, picked out by a number of human neuroimagers uh, in these disorders. So in the end, uh, we hope there'll be translational value but there's a very deep, just basic science kind of underpinning to all of this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so with these... The deepest being, how does a brain work? <laughs> <laughs> and how is it that we have this giant forebrain and a huge neocortex, and everybody's learning about the neocortex, but second only to the neocortex in kind of the so-called progression index or putative development of the brain is this giant, giant stratum mm -hmm. underneath the cortex. So we know that system is in elaborate loops with the neocortex, but in the old days, probably it had its primary effects downstream, downstream to premotor regions that are called central pattern generators. Mm -hmm. And so they control things like walking and breathing and all of that. And out of that, uh, we developed the idea, maybe the reason that, the reason, in quotes, that the basal ganglia in, say, primates and some other species have such strong input to the neocortex, mm -hmm. of course, indirectly through the thalamus, maybe part of the reason is we need to be able to make new patterns. We need to be able to make cognitive patterns, mm -hmm. not just you know, breathing and all these elemental ones. So that's actually, it's that idea that, that led to what I'm talking about. Right, right. So, so going back to the idea that you could 
do these manipulations. I think it was the micro stimulations right. in the uh, right. singlet, anterior singlet, anterior singlet cortex mm -hmm. um, that could shift shift the the, the trade off values right. that the macaque was perceiving. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, what what in what direction that happened and where you think the projections were that were right. uh, causing that? So. <clears throat> So those regions, the anterior cingulate, and we think the caudal orbital frontal cortex, they, we had found many, many years ago, like to project to these com distributed compartments in the stratum called striosomes. And that's why Ken and I originally started on this and um, two people, anyway. So then I want to mention that Satoko Amamori, wife of Kenichi Amamori, a wonderful, wonderful team. She brought to the table the interest in tracing the connections in the very animals in which we did the recording and the microstimulation. And her first results suggest that indeed, in a hot spot, that <clears throat> which when microstimulated produces sort of pessimistic behavior on the part of the monkey, that sort of hot spot probably projects to striosomes preferentially, maybe not entirely. It's early days, and I, I, I have to say, I, we haven't talked about these data before, and it's very much ongoing. Mm -hmm. So I hope mm -hmm. in a year this story is uh, borne out, but, but it's at least, we're pretty excited about it, okay. actually. Yeah, it's very exciting. So, so the reason is, let me just say, the yeah. reason is that if you look at all that we know about what the basal ganglia related pathways do, look at the whole thing, it's quite amazing because they're definitely related to whether we move or we don't move and, mm -hmm. you know, Parkinson's patient, all of this. But in addition, there's this other side of the basal ganglia that somehow relates to a much more uh, cognitive or even emotional side of things. And here are these little islands of, they're not really islands, it's long tubes that are connected, but these little islands, so to say, of limbic-like uh, putative function mm -hmm. connected with regions of the brain that we do relate to mood and emotion, mm -hmm. dotted through this sensory motor structure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's, you know, ultimately, maybe they help decide what we're motivated to do or not motivated to do. So lots of people talk about the ventral striatum, mm -hmm. and they think the ventral striatum, and, and I'm sure this is probably true, has to do with uh, primary reinforcement and then m motivation to do something or avoid something. But maybe even in the non-ventral part, these regions that are so heavily interconnected with neocortex, mm -hmm. maybe such um, functional organization is there. Right, and so uh, you, you, you talked about uh, shifting the, the macaques towards a more pessimistic decision making. Right. So w what are your thoughts and your data on how that could interplay with uh, anxiety? Yeah, so <clears throat> people who are are anxious, are worried about the future, they're worried stuff will be bad, right? And anytime, have you ever been anxious, you will you will remember that there was some worry in there somewhere, right? And so I don't know if there's a worry circuit, but <clears throat> we do think that anxiety is in the mix. And one of the reasons is that when we do this microstimulation and we get an effect, for example, the, the monkeys act more pessimistic, we can completely reverse that by giving anxiety-reducing drugs or anxiolytics. Yeah, we, we gave diazepam, and it's it's a kind of uh, we can do different doses and get a dose response curve. So it's very very effective. Mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm. So I want to uh, another large area of research uh, that, that you've been involved with for quite some time is how behaviors turn into habits and what that involves. So can you tell us a little bit about uh, your recent work there? Yeah, so I guess the thing that, that some people are quite interested in is the fact that we can prevent a habit from forming or we can uh, block a habit that has been formed and then we can bring it back. 
So that's thanks to optogenetics mm -hmm. uh, experiments. But but I think fundamentally a, a, a pretty interesting thing is that one part of the system, when we record, we recorded from many different parts. That's mm -hmm. the talk I didn't give. <laughs> so the sensory motor part of the stride and put a lot of electrodes in, it turns out that over time, as, as, as little mice and rats learn a habit, um, the cells stop responding to everything and start m especially emphasizing the beginning and the end of, of the behavior. In, in our case, they run mazes and get rewarded at mm -hmm. the end of the mazes. Then we found, and so that next part, Katie Thorne came along and for her thesis, showed that the non-sensory motor part of the stridum, it isn't like that at all. It, it sells like to concentrate on the decision period of the task. So when the guy gets to the T in a T maze, those cells swell up in their activity, presumably as the animal is deciding. Mm -hmm. And then when the, the behavior becomes a habit, they stop firing as much. And we got the idea, that, gee, you don't suppose that the, there are decision-making circuits that come on board, gradually, you know, the animal learns better and better make the decision, and then there comes a time when the brain wants to shift it to a habit, so you, the brain doesn't want to have to think out the decision every time. Which in turn led us, where us is Kyle Smith and myself, um, to say, well, there's another habit region, or region related to habit, up in the neocortex. Would it also have this sort of permissive kind of um, function? And so, Kyle recorded there and found that, at least in the upper layers of the cortex, which is itself a fascinating thing, that it's layer selective. Mm -hmm. In those upper layers, the cells continue to fire all as the animal's learning, and no great pattern is forming, none of the bracket. We didn't see the peak so much in the middle. But when that behavior really got stamped in, so it, during a long overtraining period, all of a sudden, we got this bracketing pattern up in the cortex. So then we knew, and let me run, record in a few places, but then we knew that, or we thought, could it be that you have to have, if you're going to have something, be it, let me start over, if you're going to have something that's really a habit, yeah. you better, if you can, figure out that it's a valuable behavior. Right. And so maybe, in fact, you've got to get all the way until both the stridum and the Cortex, neocortex have decided this is a keeper. Uh -huh. And if it's a keeper, go ahead and have a habit. Cool. So that's, that cortical region is the one that we turned on and off optogenetically. That's really, really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts on these topics with us. You're, you're most welcome. Fun to talk.